girls, and we can get started here. Thank you everybody for your patience this morning. So today we're going to talk about the earth and berm noise reduction analysis research project that we did. My name is Kimberly Burton. I'm with Burton Planning Services, and we're the uh, group that did the study for the ODA Office of Research and uh, ODA OES. All right, so today, um, quick outline, we're going to talk about where this project originated from, what our goals and objectives were, then we're going to get into the context of our scope of work, what we were planning to do. Uh, then we'll talk about the analysis and evaluation, and then our conclusions and recommendations. So first for the project background, um, I put in here a direct quote from the report on what our problem statement was to get the full uh, effect of what we were trying to do. So the statement was that earth and berms mitigate noise, and we know they're less expensive to construct typically than structural walls, but there hasn't been a lot of research done on the actual cost comparisons and the actual different acoustic benefit comparisons on whether earth and mounds are more effective than structural walls. So that was really what we were trying to do is look at cost and look at mitigation effectiveness. So for our uh, goals for the project, first, uh, like I said, we wanted to compare the acoustic effectiveness between earthen berms and concrete walls. So we focused just on concrete walls for this study. And we also um, wanted to look at the cost effectiveness while incorporating construction costs right-of-way costs and maintenance costs, so not just the typical construction costs that we look at. So the results, uh, the intended results were for ODOT to use uh, to update their noise policies and also look at maybe some construction practices so that we could possibly look at some cost savings over time. All right, so uh, I'm going to go over the tasks very briefly of what we're scoped to do, uh, the results of our lit search, and then I'll get into the details for our noise uh, readings and field documentation. So we had 10 major steps that we were doing for this study. First, of course, we had lots of meetings and calls and updates, as everyone does. But then we uh, wanted to start with a literature search, because we didn't want to recreate the wheel of what was out there. So we wanted to see what's been done and really build off of that. And then um, we basically drove around the entire state and did field readings everywhere and uh, documented everything we could possibly think of. Uh, so that was a really big part of the project. And then steps five, six, and seven, we analyzed the field data, we analyzed a small snapshot model, and then we threw everything in spreadsheets to start comparing and contrasting. Uh, the last few steps were drafting the report, finalizing it, we put a fact sheet together, and of course today's presentation. Okay, so the, um, the literature search summary uh, didn't take very long because there wasn't a lot out there we found. So um, most sources agreed that uh, earthen mounds are very aesthetically appealing compared to structural walls. Um, they are a little bit better psychologically, so you feel a little less constrained when there's wall versus a wall looming over you. Um, uh, they don't require safety fences, they cost a little bit less, and they have an unlimited lifespan. However, there weren't really any hard facts comparing and contrasting. So um, we ended up going out to 45 different sites throughout the state. So uh, 35 of those were earthen berms. So we basically found as many earthen berm sites as we could around the state. And then we also went to some structural wall locations that were nearby to help kind of compare and contrast. Uh, so here's a map of all the locations we looked at. Uh, you can see um, the green dots are the earthen mounds and the yellow dots are the structural noise walls. So you can see, I think there's a pointer on here. Um, up, we hit everywhere in Northeast Ohio, a few spots in Northwest Ohio, quite a few in Central Ohio, and several in West and Southwest Ohio. So we uh, have covered the entire state. So uh, for those of you that are noise reading nerds, I just want to cover all the details of exactly what we did in the field. 
So uh, we followed, of course, ODOT's manuals. Uh, we followed FHWA's measurement of highway-related noise manual, and then um, kind of in the spirit of traffic count standards, we only took readings on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays so that we could kind of optimize our results for the best traffic days. Uh, we made sure we weren't near a holiday, and then our readings were, we started in December. As you can imagine, in Ohio weather, we didn't do a whole lot in the winter, but we tried to, whenever there was a, a sunny, non-windy, dry day, we did go out, and then we ended up taking noise readings through July to get them all done. So uh, we made sure the wind speeds were less than 10 miles per hour so they wouldn't see the results. Like I said, the pavement had to be dry. Uh, we did extend our readings. We took them for an hour just once again to optimize the results, make sure that we didn't have anything skewing our results with a few semis going by or something like that. And uh, we used Quest Sound Pro meters with ca uh, calibrators. So uh, for data collection, you can see a map in the top right corner of an example of where our sites were for each location. Uh, we took four readings at every single location. So um, every location has a noise meter A, B, C, and D location. A was either at the top of the berm or the top of the wall, depending on what site it was. For those of you wondering how we got to the top of a wall, uh, we purchased a very, very long metal bar and basically stuck the meter on it and propped it up there. So we were able to get to the top of the structure walls and the top of the berm. Uh, for noise meter B, that was the rear base of the wall. Well, you know, the berm would be a little bit further back, as you can see in the picture there. This is the berm site. Uh, for a structural wall, it would be kind of right next to A. For noise meter C and D, we're basically going back 100 feet each time just to really get a feel for what the, the noise is doing behind these walls. So we took photos of the meters, the front and the back of the walls, and of course uh, we wanted to make sure we got um, the true settings. We took some photos of the vegetation out there too. Uh, while they were taking readings, we counted cars, trucks, heavy trucks. And we took temperature readings and wind speed readings just to get a, a full view of what was out there. So uh, in the report, there's a very detailed table of all of the data we collected. But this is kind of a summary table here for you. So um, we worked with ODOT to identify and locate all the different uh, berms and walls we wanted to take readings at. And we recorded the date and time while we were out doing the field work. Uh, we identified it the berm or wall, what kind of vegetation was there, um, the height of the wall based on the edge of pavement and based on the base of the wall, uh, the length and the peak length. So for earthen mounds, there's a total length of a berm, but of course it slopes up, so we also measured the peak height length on the berms. Um, so the uh, most of that was from field work, but the peak length we generated from GIS mapping with uh, train lines. Environmental conditions, we looked at temperature and wind. We gathered that when we were in the field. Uh, traffic, we recorded the speed limit and also counted all the cars in both directions. Um, for meters, um, we measured the distance. And then we also recorded the minimum, maximum, and LEQs for the readings. And then, of course, any kind of notes of interesting things while we were out there. OK, so let's get into the analysis and evaluation we did. Uh, first, we did quite a bit of analysis and evaluation on the actual field results. So just looking at the raw data, what did it tell us? Uh, what did it indicate? What were the trends? So um, as you would probably expect, noise meter A, which is at the top of all the walls, was the loudest. Um, and as you would also expect, as you got farther away, it got quieter. So overall, the noise levels did decrease from A to D. Um, and you can see uh, on the tables at the bottom, the left side are the earth and berms. And you can see, on average, how they decrease and the structure walls on the right. And you can see how, on average, they decrease. And uh, so the graph on the far right, we graphed every single one of the walls just so you can have a visual to see how they decrease over, over distance. So uh, part of the detailed analysis that we did is we really wanted to 
uh, figure out what had major effect on the noise levels, a minor effect on the noise levels, and what appeared to have no effect on the noise levels from all the field data we collected. So from our analysis, it looked like traffic volumes, distance offset, traffic speed, and functional class all had a major effect on the noise values. Uh, berm height and temperature also seemed to contribute a little bit, but when we looked at the difference in noise levels when you sort by vegetation, berm length, or wind speed, what, uh, there was really no effect, which you would expect, especially for the wind speed, because we made sure we weren't out there on windy days. So to get a little bit more into detail of the results, uh, for the traffic volumes, which we determined had a major effect on the noise level, uh, we know that total vehicles and total cars, as traffic volumes increase, the noise levels increase an average of one decibel for every thousand vehicles at all four meter locations. And when we looked at just trucks, uh, for meter A, the noise levels increase 10 decibels for every thousand trucks. At meters B, C, and D, they increase six decibels for every thousand trucks. So pretty significant. Uh, for distance offset, it was also a major effect. So for ma meter A, uh, there was about a three decibel reduction for every hundred feet offset from the edge of the road. For meters B and C, there was a two decibel reduction for every hundred feet offset. And for meter D, uh, not much of a difference, which you would expect because those were the farthest away. Um, but it was one decibel reduction for every 100 feet off. And then the other two major effects were traffic speed and functional class. So for traffic speed, uh, we know that meter A, for every 10 miles per hour increase, there was a corresponding 2.5 decibel increase. And for meters B, C, and D, um, they were affected as much as about 0.1 decibels for every 10 miles per hour. Uh, functional class was an interesting one because functional class um, did show direct correlations, but usually functional class is tied to traffic volume, so we think that's made mainly why functional class was such a major factor because um, the, the bigger roads had more traffic and they had a higher functional class. Uh, so when we did a further analysis, we didn't consider functional class further because we felt it was more of an aspect just of traffic volume. All right, so for minor effects, for berm height, uh, at meter B, the noise level decreased about an average of one decibel for every 10 feet of height. And C and D, there really weren't many changes based on berm height. Uh, for temperature, we did see a little bit of an effect also. For A, the uh, LEQs increased by about 1.3 decibels for every 10 degrees of temperature increase. And meter B showed less of an effect just about one decibel, and C and D were, were very, very low. Um, in addition, I wanted to call out that uh, the, the really short earthen mounds actually showed a, a surprising effectiveness for mitigation. So I wanted to mention that uh, these small height berms, we had quite a few that were less than six feet. So we went ahead and we did an additional analysis by grouping the berms by berm height. So we looked at six feet or less as small height. Medium height, we looked at eight to 10 feet. Uh, tall height, we looked at 12 to 14 feet. And very tall height, we looked at greater than 14 feet, just to see if we could uh, identify any patterns. And uh, what was interesting when we grouped by height, we noticed that most of the noise results are pretty similar from group to group. Uh, which indicated that the small height berms were performing just about as well as the other heights. So this is something that ODOT indicated they want to study further probably to see what's really going on with the small height berms and can we take advantage of that in some of our construction practices. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, vegetation, berm length, and wind speed didn't seem to have much of an effect on our field data. Uh, so really no appreciable difference with the vegetation, which uh, typically vegetation is more of a psychological mitigation factor than an actual true mitigation factor. So that's not too surprising. Uh, berm length uh, didn't really appear to affect the overall noise levels, which um, I guess can kind of make sense because we were taking our noise reading kind of in the middle of all the berms and the walls. So it, you really aren't going to see what those end differences are. 
And then the wind speed, like I said, we kept it under 10 miles per hour whenever we went out, so we wouldn't expect to see an appreciation. So um, the tricky part is that once we got in there and looked at all the patterns, we really expected that the berms would come out to be reducing the noise levels better than the structural walls. And when we found out that that was not the case with the raw data, we, we really had to take a step back and think, what's going on? And so we, we reviewed the field data again, and we realized a couple patterns. One is that our berm sites were typically further away from the road than the wall sites. And also the wall sites where we took readings on average had higher traffic volumes than the berm sites that we picked. And as we talked about just a minute ago, uh, distance offset and traffic volumes have major effects on noise levels. So we went through and came up with some equivalency adjustments to try to normalize the data so it would be a true apples to apples comparison. Uh, so uh, what we did, uh, oh, yeah, so here's an example. Uh, it's like noise meter A levels average 7.71.7 decibels for berms and 77.9 for walls. So 6.2 decibels is a pretty noticeable difference. So uh, we ended up doing uh, a distance offset adjustment um, by taking TNM and we put an additional uh, noise meter zero point. So we've got noise meter A, B, C, and D. So we put a, another point right on the edge of pavement at all of our sites in TNM. So basically the um, height is the same. The distance offset is the same. The only thing um, different really are the traffic volumes at this point. So we wanted to see if we put a point at the same edge of payment for all of our sites using the traffic volumes we collected in the field, what would happen to our data. And so what happened is that our, our noise results still showed a difference of about 2.6 decibels on average. So, we're, so basically that's indicating that we're even though we've adjusted for distance offset, traffic volumes are most likely still having an effect because, once again, the, wall, the structural walls had higher volumes than the berms. So what we did is we took that 2.6 and manually adjusted the noise levels at the structural walls to be equal then to the berm level. And then we went through and our, we did our averages again and everything started lining up. So. Um, once we found out that those, everything was apples to apples, then we started looking at barrier heights. And even though the noise level didn't indicate there being a problem, uh, we, we realized that the berm heights that we looked at were ranging from 3 to 24 feet. And the wall heights, the structural walls, were ranging from 10 to 19 feet. So we felt that when we're doing a true, true apples to apples comparison, that we should pull out the berm heights that were outside of the 10 to 19 feet so we can really get that direct comparison. So we, um, I'll show you that in some screenshots in a little bit. So um, our, our final step then was to get these final conversion factors figured out. What, what, what is it really from a berm to a wall? So we assumed a, a linear height noise reduction relationship and put in our equivalency <coughs> adjustment. And from that, and I'll, I'll show you the calculations in a second, from that we came up with a 1 to 1.19 conversion from berm to walls. So basically it's saying that for every one foot of uh, earthen mound height, you need 1.19 feet of structural walls, which sounds kind of small, but it, when you think about how high walls can get, how long walls can get and how expensive they can get, it actually really adds up. So um, after we analyzed our field data quite thoroughly, we wanted to just do one snapshot evaluation in TNM just to see how the data was looking. Uh, see if it really kind of came out similarly in TNM versus what we saw in the field. So even though we weren't really supposed to do noise modeling, we did just, just one little mini noise model, basically, because I wanted to. Um, but uh, I really want to see that snapshot between the two. So 
We picked uh, Site 34 in Clinton County because it was a really nice level site. So we really didn't build a whole lot in the way of elevations or anything like that to the model because it's just a quick snapshot. And so we created two basic scenario models, one for berm, one for wall. And so we just threw in uh, receivers, which is where the noise meters were, uh, the train lines just for the berm, one barrier line for where the structure wall would replace the berm, and two roadway lines indicating each direction of travel. And that's all we put in there. And so um, scenario one was the existing conditions. So basically, uh, we wanted to create a, a very basic model that still gave us the same results from the field uh, results. And once we um, were emulating what we saw in the field, we took the berm out and we stuck a line in for structural wall, and we ran it again. And then we just moved the wall, structural wall height, up and down until we got to the same uh, noise level mitigation. And so from doing that, just at one site in a basic model, our results were actually pretty similar. So our results showed that for every one foot of berm height, you need 1.1 feet of structural wall height, whereas the field data said 1.19. So I think if you know we were to do additional models, especially detailed models, we'd get even a more refined number. But this made us feel much more confident in our field data analysis results that our little snapshot model is coming up with something very similar. So uh, once we analyzed all the raw data and played in TNM a little bit, we built a big spreadsheet. So um, the spreadsheet had five parts. Uh, the first tab was cost variables and calculations. The second tab was initial cost comparisons. The third tab was the life cycle cost comparisons. The fourth was the equivalent height comparisons, and the fifth tab is the noise barrier spreadsheet calculator, where you can basically type in any height and length and see what your costs and heights are. Uh, so the cost-benefit analysis, like we were scoped to do, includes construction, right-of-way, and maintenance costs. And so that's in, like, so the first tab. So um, we wanted to make sure that we're including more than just construction costs to get a true life cycle cost of these berms and walls when we're comparing them. So the base information supplied by ODOT included um, their current average construction cost per cubic foot of berms and per square feet of walls, uh, the typical berm slopes that we're designing earthen mounds at in Ohio, uh, the, and we got the total length of structural walls around the state and the maintenance expenditures on those walls around the state. Uh, for right-of-way costs, uh, we went into the county auditor's websites for all of our uh, noise reading sites around the state, and we downloaded land value information of all the parcels within 1,000 feet. So we then converted those values to a cost per acre, and we grouped those values into uh, land use type and location type. And then we averaged them to come up with the unit cost. So our basic Four land use types were residential, rural, or small city, residential suburban, residential urban, and other, because we had some parks and schools that we took readings at also. So uh, here's a, a graph of our results from our property values to develop our right-of-way costs. So these are all 45 sites, and they're sorted by looking at where they are located within the state to see if they're in a rural, small city area a suburban area or an urban area. And that really, really, really tall one, red one on the far right is New Albany, and they were totally thrown off, thrown off our property value uh, estimates, so we threw New Albany out because they're too expensive, and we're skewing our results. So um, you can see a nice uh, progression in with, without New Albany. So here's a screenshot of the first tab of the spreadsheet. I'll show a zoomed in one here in a second. So this is the cost variables and calculations tab. Uh, so you can see that there's three sections, and everything in orange is where you can enter in information. So basically, as um, costs change over time or property values change over time, you can enter new ones in, and it updates all the calculations and the rest of the spreadsheet. 
So this is the very top part. So for berms, we looked at construction right away and maintenance costs. Um, so we did a two to one slope, uh, $15 per cubic yard. Uh, once again, a two to one slope, and we set our maintenance costs at zero for berms. Uh, and so that's something where in later years, if we want to maybe start thinking about one to one slope, or if the cubic yard, the cost goes down or up, depending on where you're getting the, the uh, materials from, or uh, if we start throwing maybe mowing into the maintenance cost, uh, this can be easily updated by just putting that into the orange cells. A little bit down on that tab is the, the wall uh, assumptions. So construction costs right now are at $25 a square foot. You can change it to 35, you can change it to 15, you can change it to any number you want in updates. Uh, we assumed a very narrow base width just for right away, just because we want to put some kind of a cost in there for right away. And uh, so for maintenance costs, uh, what we did is we looked at how much ODOT spends per year on maintenance of all the walls in the state, came up with the length of those walls, and then divided it to get down to a unit cost for maintenance. And then the bottom part of that tab are the right away costs. So we've got um, all the calculations that came out of that graph, uh, we came up with the unit cost from that. So you see rural small cities right away is going at about 23,000 an acre at the sites we were at. Uh, suburban, 140,000. Urban, much less, 89,000. And other, uh, just like said, parks. So that was, I think there was some commercial in there too, so that skewed the results on the right away cost for that. So once we set up all the assumptions, then on the second tab, we did our initial cost comparison. So that's where um, we assembled everything by construction, right away, maintenance cost, and by land use type. Uh, we have an entry at the top that I'll show you in a second where you can put in your preferred barrier height and length to see what your uh, cost is over time. And like I said the maintenance costs are in there also. So, um, <clears throat> so once again, orange cells are what you can enter in. We just put 10 feet and 1,000 feet in there just for a base assumption. So you can change it to any height or any length. And then for the initial cost, you can see uh, the land use types on the left, and then construction right away, and total cost columns for berm and for walls. And then we've got the maintenance cost at the next section down below where you see the berms are zeroed out everywhere, and the maintenance for uh, structural walls are the same no matter where you are. So we took these initial costs, and we put them into a life cycle cost spreadsheet to compare them. So basically, now we're adding time into the calculations. Uh, we showed it graphically and in a spreadsheet, and so the results are showing us that in year one, if we look at a 10-foot height uh, barrier that's 1,000 feet long, the structural wall is costing two to four times more than the berm, depending on the type of land use it's located in. And if we look 20 years out, the structural wall is costing now three to five times more than the berm because of those maintenance costs. So here's a screenshot of the overall spreadsheet. Uh, you can see year 1 through 10, um, the first few columns are the berms based on their different land uses, and the next four columns are the walls based on the land uses. Um, and you can see there at the very, very top row, um, this 10 feet and this 1,000 feet are pulling in from that previous tab. So if you go back to uh, this tab and change it here, it'll update here. So here's a close-up of part of that table. On the left side, these are the berm costs. Um, and then on the right side, here's the structural wall costs. And then this is uh, the graph of that same data. Uh, the red and pinkish lines are the berms, and the bluish lines are the structural walls. So you can see over time, um, the berms stay about the same cost-wise because there's no maintenance costs accumulating over time as the structural walls are increasing over time because of maintenance costs. 
So the fourth tab in the spreadsheet is where we did all of those equivalent height calculations that I just talked about. Uh, so method one was looking at all the field data analysis that we did. So that's that one to 1.9 feet adjustment that we talked about. Method two is the snapshot scenario for the one site that we modeled in TNM. And then we have a final calculation section where we decided just to average those two methods to come up with um, equivalent height of 1 to 1.15. So this is a screenshot of the top of that tab. And you notice that um, the left side is a lot of grayed out data. So that is the grayed out data is the shorter and the taller height for the berms that we decided to not use when we were comparing uh, the walls to the, the berms to the structural walls so that you can see there's a, in black on the left we've got 10 to 18 feet and on the right we've got 10 to 19 feet. So basically we compared the similar heights and then grayed out the dissimilar heights even though they're there if you want to look at them. And this is the bottom of that tab that shows how we did the calculations. Um, so the top part above that gray bar is the end of the field data analysis where you can see in that row just above the gray bar that we do the 1.9. And then option two, like I said, that was the scenario model uh, where we basically adjusted the structural wall heights until we got the same noise reduction, 15.5 and 15.6, which is pretty darn close. So that came out to be 1 to 1.11. And then we just combined the results to get 1 to 1.15. Here's a zoom in of the top there. So you can really see that we've got the different heights. Uh, the edge of pavement noise levels, meter D, and the differences, and then at, like the 10 feet is when we uh, ungrade them out and started looking at comparisons. And on the right side, these are the wall heights. And then scrolling down on the sheet, like you can see the calculations a little bit more easily. And the very bottom of the sheet, you can see those calculations now. All right, so the fifth and final tab in our spreadsheet we're calling the noise barrier spreadsheet calculator. So basically everything that happened in tabs one through four, all of those results are combined to do quick and easy cost estimates and barrier height estimates. So there's uh, three tables in this tab. The first one is uh, a direct cost comparison between berms and walls at the same height. And then the second two are basically quick conversions. So you can start with the berm height, enter that in, to get a equivalent wall height and cost comparison, and three is if you're going from wall to berm instead of berm to wall. So here's a screenshot of the entire tab, and I'll zoom in here in a minute. But you can see it has three different sections, uh, and then like I said at the top, uh, you can basically estimate by the four different land uses, um, any height, any length, and any amount of time. Uh, the second group, once again, if you start with your berm information, you can see what your equivalent wall height results and cost comparisons are. And the third one is if you start with berm information, you can see what your, or wall information, you can see what your equivalent berm height and results are. So this is a zoom in of the top section. And I'm going to run through a quick calculation so you can see how this works. So uh, this is the top part completely blank, and once again, orange cells mean you can enter stuff in. So let's say we want to do a 10 foot high uh, wall of some sort, and 11 feet, or 1,000 feet, and let's look at 10 years. So you can see that if you're in a rural or small city, that's going to cost you about $66,000 for berms and close to $300,000 for walls. If we decide to look at 20 years out, now the berm cost is still the same, but we've gone up to about $340,000 for the walls because of those additional maintenance costs. And just for comparison purposes, we threw in the exact same dimensions and time, but in a suburban area. And so the costs are, are doubling for the berm because those right-of-way costs go up. But for the wall, they're about the same because the right-of-way costs aren't really a factor. However, you can still see the wall is more than twice as much as the berm. 
All right, and so another example, uh, this is the very bottom lookup table. Let's say you've finished your noise analysis in TNM and you've modeled a structural wall. And the structural wall results are saying that in your rural area that you've got your project, the best wall is 10 feet high, 1,000 feet long, and you want to look at a 10-year time frame. The, uh, you can take that and say, all right, if we have room for a berm, the berm would only need to be 8.68 feet high to still get the same noise mitigation results. Um, and you can see the cost differences. So it only be about a $51,000 cost versus a $300,000 cost for the wall. So um, this is a nice quick way to, after finishing your noise analysis, getting the results of any height, length, or time frame that you can say, I've got room for a berm, what would I need to build? And that's what you would need to build. Uh, just a comparison with a suburban area uh, with the same dimensions and the same time frame, it's still the same equivalent height, but you could see the, the different cost comparisons. The berm would cost a little bit more in the suburban area, but it's still only about a third the cost of the wall. Um, and so we also did just a really quick qualitative evaluation of berms because we thought that was an important factor since earthen berms do have that aesthetic uh, nature to them. So uh, we uh, looked at positive and factors and we're calling them challenges with berms. So aesthetically and visually, berms are typically more appealing than walls. Um, they're a little bit better on the environment and uh, you don't have as many impacts from the area from construction. You're not drilling, you're not bulldozing, you're, you're really just building an earthen mound and planting and the, the residents appreciate that a little bit more usually. Uh, for challenges, the, the really the main thing, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody, is space because berms just take up so much room and there very often is not room. So um, ground space is really the number one challenge with berms. Uh, but a few other ones that we identified are, you know, conflicts with utilities and lighting, making sure that those are accounted for, uh, can affect drainage, so making sure those are designed properly, um, any kind of a clear zone issue in the area, and just making sure that the vegetation is selected appropriately and it's properly maintained and people know who's supposed to be maintaining it. All right, so to wrap this up, um, we had a few conclusions and some recommendations that we looked at. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, we determined that major effects were traffic volume, distance offset, traffic speed, and functional class that were tied back to traffic volume. Minor effects were berm height and temperature. And keep in mind that the, there's a strong performance by the small height berm and no effect with vegetation, berm length, and wind speed. <laughs> For our life cycle cost comparison, looking at construction right away and maintenance costs, um, we, looked, we included a lot of variables in the earthen berm calculations, including slope, uh, construction material cost, berm volume, right away cost by land use, and maintenance costs were set at zero. For the concrete structural walls, we looked at construction materials, uh, baseball depth, right-of-way costs, and the maintenance costs. And we derived those from all the historical maintenance expenditures at ODOT. Then we created this interactive 20-year table and graph comparing those total values over time and found that the earth amount is more cost-effective than a structural wall in year 0, in year 10, in year 20, increasingly over time. For the equivalent effective height factor, so we looked at a few different methods just to make sure that we were on the right track. Method one was analyzing our field data, which came up to a 1 to 1.9 equivalency from berm to wall. Method two was a snapshot scenario, and that came up with a 1 to 1.11 equivalency, which when averaged uh, was in the final calculation and combining those two was 1 to 1.15, showing that berms are more effective at reducing noise levels than structural wall uh, for either method. And then the uh, noise barrier spreadsheet calculator that we just went through, we've got those three interactive tables uh, for quick estimations of costs, uh, berm-to-wall conversions, wall-to-berm conversions, 
and uh, what those equivalent effective heights and costs are. Uh, the spreadsheet was developed so that you can easily update any variables, costs, uh, volumes over time so that if you want to keep using it, it's not a problem. So uh, <coughs> overall recommendations. Uh, we found that earthen berms are both more cost effective and more effective at noise reduction than structural walls. Uh, from that, we think that ODOT should consider prioritizing earth and, building earthen mounds over structural walls just for uh, cost savings, maintenance, all of, all of those factors. Uh, so when you're doing a new barrier construction from a new nose analysis, if there's room, let's be trying to get an earthen mound in there. And then if there's an old barrier that you have to replace for maintenance reasons, uh, look and see if you can get an earthen mound to fit. So successfully doing those two things should result in a significant annual cost savings over time, both related to construction costs and related to maintenance costs that compound over time. Um, it's also important to remember that there's the qualitative benefits with earth and mounds too, uh, quality of life for residents, motorists, air, and wildlife. So some potential obstacles and costs that we identified in our analysis. Obviously, the, the main thing is that limited space, earth and worms do take up room, and also our higher revised code prohibits property acquisition for noise mitigation right now, so that uh, does make it a little more challenging to build earth and mounds. Um, in addition, a lot of local governments have zoning and development codes that allow developers to build right up to roads, so it prevents even having that easement or that setback room to be able to put an earth and mound in. And then the third thing is just uh, even if we wanted to look at taking property for earthen mounds from property owners, property owner rights are an issue. So uh, the recommended policy changes uh, would involve some staff time, but really it's more of a cost savings than a cost to implement these changes. Uh, Schedule-wise, we looked at the short, medium, and long-term implementation of the results in the short term, just updating the ODOT manual. In the medium term, after this year, maybe updating and preparing, um, distributing different educational materials for the public. And then after that, uh, trying to see if there's any ODOT policies and programs that can be updated. And once again, like I said before, uh, the spreadsheet was designed to update, so probably every five to ten years or whenever our unit costs change over time, we should be updating the spreadsheet to use it. Um, of course, we came up with a million different study ideas that we kept thinking of while we were working on this project. So first, uh, we have to go back and do some TNM modeling of each of the sites just to see what comes out uh, to really uh, validate that data and get a true, true apples to apples comparison to every single site between a berm and a wall. Uh, second suggestion was adding barrier type questions to public opinion surveys to really document what the public thinks of earth and mounds versus structural walls. Uh, the third was expanding uh, to similar studies in other states so that we can get even more data to see what are their results, are they similar, what do the trends look like in other states. Uh, fourth suggestion is to add additional detail to our cost variables that we developed. So maybe additional construction cost data based on maybe for earthen mounds where the earth is originating from. Is it being transported or is it local? Um, or right away cost wise, uh, is it already ODOT owned so we don't have a right away cost? Um, structural wall materials, looking at fiberglass, concrete, and all the other different materials that are used, um, and I already mentioned transporting. Um, this suggestion is refining property values, uh, working with the real estate folks to really come up with a really good unit cost for different areas and regions of the state versus just those neighborhoods. Um, adding present value calculations would be really nice when you're looking at time frames. And then the last one, um, you know, further assessing these small height earthen berms via field work and modeling to see acoustically how are they really functioning and performing and what can we do with that. 
Okay, so um, I'm not sure if Noel wanted to say a few things or if I covered everything. <laughs> okay, great. So I looks like we can take any questions you guys might have um, at this point. First, we'll start with questions in the room here because nobody has let me know they have questions online. If you do, just let me know and I will unmute your line. Okay. Yeah. Or is there information about like the, the size of the or, or the growth of these zones? Yep. And did you find anything in the research about risk of depending on how close are you really taking this mechanism ramp like a, a launching pad, which I I think I love green noise walls and I love this idea. I'm just wondering if anyone can bring that concern up in case we create this way to you know, elevate vehicles off the roadway and launch them. Okay, yeah, so for your first question, um, we assume the two to one slope, that was what ODOT standard right now, um, but that can be, it's one of the orange cells, so if we want to do four to one, one to one, uh, that can be accounted for. Um, for um, launching a vehicle into space, we did not look at that as a qualitative challenge. Is, is that an issue that has happened from the state or country that you guys have heard of? No, we had videos of really? cars that hit like uh, drainage um, mm -hmm. inlets, you know, the drainage inlets are kind of like a nice slope. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I was wondering yeah. if you know, make it as potential that the car can see the road and hit a nice gravel slope. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point that if if these were starting to be built more prevalently that, that that would want to be considered in design or some kind of mitigation options, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Kim, um, there's a lot of interesting info in this, and I, I really appreciate what was done with the property value. Oh. Uh, really, was always the elephant in the room on a lot of this site, so I appreciate that. And I have a lot of questions. I'll ask one. Um, before you started talking about um, the apples to apples part mm -hmm. of your talk, you said a couple things. Um, one is that berm height had only a minor effect, mm -hmm. observed field data. And the second thing you said was uh, earth berms generally are not as effective if I have to uh, control as walls, possibly because of offset mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And then we had an equivalency of mm -hmm. 1.19 to 1 or mm -hmm. reverse. Can you kind of run through that again yeah. so we, we understand it all? And I, I understand, I think, what you Getting at here. And what is work what does it work with that equivalency? Can you summarize his question before you answer? Oh, okay, good idea. In case they couldn't hear. Okay, so uh, Rick was asking um, about well first he said that he really liked the idea that we included right away costs in our calculation. And then he was asking about the equivalency adjustments in our factors. And um, and that, that's why I wanted to stress that we did that because I didn't want there to be any um, magical things happening that people wondered how we suddenly got from raw data to what we wanted to see. Um, so we, we were surprised to see that it was not coming out to what we assumed. So that's why we took a, a really hard look at the data. And once we realized those two very major effects of distance offset being different and uh, traffic volumes being different, that's why we went in and actually built based TNM models for every site and tried to basically make the distance offset the same for every site. So we assumed every site was, I think it was like 34 feet was the distance offset we set a new point at at every site. And so that's why we were still getting the 2.6 decibel difference on average between the two berm and wall types. So that's where we threw in the traffic volume adjustment. However, that, that was a convenient way of doing it because we had limited data. So that's one of the main reasons we recommended wanting to go out to other states because we only have so many berms. And so really the more data we get, the more we can do a true statistical analysis of what are these differences, what are causing the differences, and how do you normalize the data. Does that help? Yes, that's very helpful. Okay. So your, your first two statements, just to make sure I'm mm -hmm. clear on this, about minor effect with height. Mm -hmm. And 
berms not as effective as the walls. That is for field observation of berms where they typically exist in Ohio, which is at deep yes. offset. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that um, the the berms and the walls mitigate very effectively, yeah. but when you change the height by a few feet, it's not as much of an effect as when you yeah. change traffic volume or distance offset. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't build any more noise walls anywhere because they don't work. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> No, I, I, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. We have a question from Cora online. Can mm -hmm. you further explain why you excluded maintenance costs on berms? You have weed control, mowing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And can you further explain why you, oh, it repeated for some reason? Sure. Same question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, mainly because Noel told us to. <laughs> 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 but I, I believe if I remember correctly, Noel, we just, um, either the, the costs for maintenance of mowing are included in other ODOT programs, so they're not really a separate line item for just berms, if I remember. Does that ring a bell? Is that why we did that? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you build a concrete wall, I mean, it's going to take a small mm -hmm. amount to take, and you're still going to have to mow mm -hmm. that area around it, which right. is similar to if you build a berm, but it's going to mow that too. So yeah, so it's kind of a wash. It's close to a wash. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and actually, you don't have to have any maintenance costs associated with the correct vegetation issues. True. There's no more mm -hmm. yeah. so, so what Elvin is saying is that depending on the vegetation that <coughs> is uh, planted on the earth mounds, there could be absolutely no maintenance costs because you might not be mowing them anyway. Yeah. Did you know any perennials or any pain on the bottom with the time? Uh, Elvin was out there and saw them firsthand. You want to repeat that for Elvin? I think we lost them. Any uh, 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 rainian? If the bottom would fall and uh, uh, it was slide down the bottom or anything? Any no, slope not, issues? Not really no. So, so all the berms were holding up just all fine when we were out there. It yeah. doesn't consolidate and off. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any cross section of the bottom? Um, so why is it at the bottom yeah. and how wide at the top? Yeah, we have all that in our GIS mapping. So we oh, have all the dimensions. The um, the top, they were all different, but weren't they about two to three feet at the top, depending on the slope? Uh, actually, three to six feet. Three to six feet at three the top. Three to six and 20 feet high, and the slope is two to one. Yeah, well, the, there was different slopes for different berms. Um, well, right. There's probably some four to ones. And it, it ranged from four to ones to, to one to ones mm -hmm. in the field. Yeah. At the bottom, it will be quite big. Yeah, that's that's uh, why the ground space. Wide at the bottom. Yeah, so that, that's why the ground space is such an issue with earth and mounds, is just having the room for them, definitely. Mm -hmm. We have another question, so maybe you could project your voice. Uh, how does ODOT calculate the reasonability for berms, and is it the same reasonability with noise barriers? That's a good question. Is it not really a calculation per se? Is it? It's close to the same because we're we're just accounting for the height of the berm, like we are accounting for the height of a concrete wall. But we're not doing this alternative yet, mm -hmm. so this is this is something new for us. Mm -hmm. So right now, the the current practices are, um, if a wall is found to be feasible. You, you might look at it to see if there's room to put an earthen mound in, and if there is, you would just build it at the same height if you could. Is that kind of what you guys do right now? Correct. Okay. But based on this study, it's... We might not need to. It's a, yeah. Yeah. The small height berms are, are pretty effective, mm -hmm. so we want to want to look at that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And from the study, the, the higher the berm went, the reductions were similar, still similar. So that's mm -hmm. Correct. That's a pretty big find. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you want to can you just point out like how many berms are private versus ours? Oh, uh, I'm all private basically. I'm trying to remember because we we basically found everything that could be considered a berm in the state to, to take field readings at. Ellen, do you remember how many? You'd say about eighty percent were private. That's significant. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, could you speculate 
uh, any differences or changes that would happen if you switch to concrete pavement type? I'm assuming most of this would asphalt pavement type in terms of noise generally. Mm. So the question, right? Yeah. So the, the question is, um, are the noise effects between concrete and asphalt pavement? Can we speculate on that? The differences. Um, I, I could speak in generalities, but I know we have some experts in the room. But basically, it depends on how the concrete is timed, um, based on um, how the uh, noise levels come off the concrete versus the asphalt. Typically, asphalt is a little bit quieter because it's smoother. But um, I know TNM and does not recognize pavement differences at this time, but uh, would the experts like to weigh in on that? Yeah, basically your asphalt and your longitude behind the concrete are very mm -hmm. similar, noise level. It's the transverse time concrete, which is the loudest space concrete. Mm -hmm. Or horizontal, yeah. Um, so I don't know if you've mm -hmm. tested any firms adjacent to transverse time concrete. <laughs> I don't think we'd. No. No, I think it was all asphalt. Yeah. I mean, you would expect the same procedure, same results. Mm -hmm. Higher, higher decibels, but <clears throat> the same <clears throat> procedure. Mm -hmm. yeah, same, same reduction. The levels would be higher because of the louder concrete pavement. Mm -hmm. so, so what they were saying is that even if the pavement is causing it to be a little louder, you're still going to probably expect the same reductions. Uh, no matter what the mitigation is you're using. Okay. Additional questions? Good questions, guys. Appreciate that. I can tell you're listening. Good. We were excited to do the project, so I appreciate everyone being here and um, being engaged in the process because it was a really neat research study that we did. If you want to read the final report or view this presentation, which is being recorded, you can visit the research website. Go under the Projects section and Final Report, and there you can find everything you need. Thank you for attending, and have a great day.